The Supermarine Seafire is one of the great examples of the British ability to bodge a solution to a problem with whatever is available at hand. Unfortunately, it is also a classic example of why that ability is necessary, a failure to adequately plan and prepare for a situation. As a result, the Sea Fire was always a compromised design and had major issues because of it, but despite that, it went on to enjoy a surprisingly fruitful and long career. The first two years of the Second World War saw the Royal Navy seriously disabused of some of their doctrinal assumptions, and one of these was what sort of shape and form that the naval fighter aircraft of the fleet air arm, the FAA, should take. At the beginning of the conflict, their main fighters for carrier use were the Blackburn Skew, the Blackburn Rock, and with the Fairy Fulmar about to enter service. If we compare them to their effective contemporaries, the American Brewster F-2A and the Japanese Mitsubishi A-6M, well, there's some very notable differences in design philosophies. The American and Japanese aircraft are fighters, single-seat, high-performance aircraft whose job was to kill enemy aircraft. Their British equivalents were notably two-seaters, and expected to be more general-purpose aircraft serving multiple roles. I'm not even going to talk about the ROC, I did a whole video on that aircraft, check it out afterwards if you are interested. But the Skewer was literally equal parts dive bomber and fighter, while the Fulmar was expected to conduct long-range reconnaissance and be more concerned with driving off enemy recon aircraft and warning the home carrier of incoming raids rather than actually engaging in massed aerial defensive actions. Because at the heart of FAA thinking at the time were two factors that made absolute sense when these aircraft were designed, but which technical advances made obsolete practically before they even flew. Firstly, flying over water, especially seas as rough and storm-wracked as the North Atlantic, which was considered the likely theatre of future conflict, is really hard. In the early 1930s, before direction fighting radio signals and navigation apparatus were standard fittings, navigation was an exercise that required huge amounts of training and technique that, quite frankly, required a dedicated crewman. Thus, British naval fighters were two-seaters, flown by a pilot and an observer, whose primary job was knowing where the aircraft was. The second factor was that in the 1920s and early 1930s, that wasn't considered too much of an issue. Two-seaters often had performance only marginally worse, sometimes even better, than single-seat fighters. That changed pretty much in the second half of the 1930s when the latest generation of single-seat monoplanes began to enter service. The Royal Navy did begin to appreciate that they may have an issue, and began to think about acquiring a single-seat fighter for fleet use. But here they hit another issue outright hostility to the idea from the Royal Air Force. And this is a theme that will reoccur during this story. The RAF was in this period rapidly building up its own strength, with the growing threat of war in Europe and the need for home defence the absolute priority. They were pretty clear that, no, there was no spare capacity to divert their newest fighters to the FAA. They needed everything they could get. The only offer that the Royal Navy had was from Gloucester, who offered to convert some Gloucester gladiators for carrier use in 1938. It pretty much sums up the rather pathetic state of affairs that when the war began on the 1st of September 1939, the FAA's best naval fighter was this, the Sea Gladiator, a fabric-covered biplane that was being replaced in RAF service as quickly as was feasible and the FAA had a grand total at the time of 54 of them. Despite all this, the Sea Gladiators would carve themselves a place in aviation legend, fighting desperate actions in Norway and Malta, though notably operating from land bases. And they were not alone in this. Despite pre-war assumptions, the Skewers and Fulmars made surprisingly good accounts of themselves, fighting now largely forgotten actions in those early grim years often against aircraft superior to themselves in both performance and numbers. But by early 1941, the lessons were clear. The FAA needed a modern, high-performance aircraft. The Royal Navy had orders in for 240 of the new Grumman F4F Wildcat, called the Martlet in FAA service, but supply of more of these was contingent on the United States' willingness to sell them. An indigenous carrier fighter was needed. And again, it was going to happen over the RAF's dead body. 
To be fair, they had just fought the Battle of Britain and were now committed to fighting in North Africa. They needed every fighter they could get. So they handed over what they said they could spare. A bunch of hard-used Hurricane Mark 1s. These, many of which had fought in several squadrons and campaigns already, received modification to make them suitable for carrier operations, and formed the first of the Sea Hurricanes. Again, these did surprisingly well, considering that the Hurricane was obsolescent as a fighter, and being shifted to ground attack duties in the RAF. They also didn't have folding wings, something that was considered an absolute must by the FAA for its aircraft. But the Hurricane's durable airframe stood up well to the tough life aboard, and several hundred were built, including later on new production aircraft, as the RAF no longer considered the type critical to their needs. The Sea Hurricanes proved extremely useful, and they were, when all said and done, better than what the FAA had before. Though that isn't saying much, a fact that was recognised all too clearly. The Admiralty became far more vocal in September 1941, pointing out that if they were to engage in offensive operations, they had to have a first-rate naval fighter. The same month, they got powerful support for that fact. Winston Churchill visited the new HMS Indomitable, the Royal Navy's latest and most formidable aircraft carrier, which was to commission into service in a few weeks' time. And he was shocked to find that the ship's main fighter defence was composed of a handful of the first converted Sea Hurricanes, aircraft that were now thoroughly second-rate compared to other fighters. Churchill made it plain that this was unacceptable, and demanded something be done to remedy the situation. When news came a few weeks later that the United States was not going to allow the sale of any more Wildcats after the current orders were complete, there was no other option. The British would have to create a modern carrier fighter from scratch in record time. And that meant there was really only one candidate for the role. The Supermarine Spitfire Mark V. The problem was, the Spitfire really wasn't suitable for the role of carrier fighter. Traditionally, these needed to be tough to deal with the battering of brutal carrier landings and catapult-assisted takeoffs, have steady handling characteristics for said takeoff and landings, and good range. The Spitfire, though a great aircraft, had none of these traits, having been created to act as a short-range, land-based interceptor. It was lightweight, dare I say it, petite which was perfect for its designed role of getting up to altitude quickly, but made it far less durable than naval aircraft traditionally were. It also had a narrow track undercarriage, again not so much of a problem on nice even airfields, but definitely an issue for landing on a pitching deck. It also had poor visibility for landing, with its long nose, and the Spitfire's landing flaps were just that, flaps for landing. There was no intermediate setting which carrier aircraft generally use to give them extra lift when shot off a carrier's catapults. In fact, there are few aircraft arguably worse set up for conversion to running off an aircraft carrier than the Spitfire. The problem was that, at the time, the British really had nothing else in service comparable. Admittedly, the Blackburn Firebrand was in development, and this, initially at least, was intended to be the sort of high-performance interceptor that the FAA required but that was still not going to be ready for service for quite a while, having not even flown at that point, and with Churchill's demand in action, the Spitfire was it. The news, in fact, brought mixed feelings from many FAA pilots, who were all excited to have the opportunity of flying the famed fighter, but had trepidation about doing so off of carriers for the reasons listed. Ironically, the Admiralty had considered the possibility of using naval Spitfires in late 1939, early 40 but the combination of it not really fitting into their doctrine at the time, plus the point-blank refusal of the Air Ministry to take any from the RAF, who, fair enough, had much more pressing need for them, soon put pay to that idea. But with the decision made, despite the RAF not being very happy about it, the Royal Navy was finally going to get its hands on Spitfires, and this earlier consideration, which had engendered some design studies at Supermarine at the time into what was needed to build a sea Spitfire, would prove useful. Because of the urgent need, the process of developing the aircraft went practically hand-in-hand -hand with its production. The first models built were straight conversions of second-hand RAF Spitfire Mark V-Bs. These, fitted with an arrestor hook and naval radios and navigation gear, were literally as basic and quick a conversion as possible, and as a result, the first deliveries to the FAA of the new type, now designated as the Seafire Mark I-B, were made in February 1942, where they began testing and familiarisation. This aircraft was the biggest bodge of the entire programme. 
As said, as conversions of existing aircraft, the changes possible were minimal. The Mark 1s retained the same armament of two 20mm cannon and four 303 machine guns, and the standard Mark 5B's Merlin 45 or 46, which produced 1,415 horsepower. Concerns about the Spitfire's fragility proved correct, and the Mark 1 Seafires generally ended up having reinforcing plates attached along their sides to add stiffening. At the same time as the Mark 1s were ordered, a second variant, the Mark II, was also commissioned. This took Spitfire Mark 5Cs that were on the production line, beefed up their frame, and equipped them with catapult spools, allowing them to be shot off a deck, something the Mark 1s couldn't, and an improved arrestor hook. As for the takeoff flap issue, well, the aircraft fitters came up with a solution. They lowered the flap, stuck a wooden wedge in, and then closed it again. The wedge gave the wing the correct angle for takeoff, and once airborne, the pilot would open the flap fully, the wedge would drop out, and then he could retract them once again. The Mark IIs also used the C wing, which enabled them to carry four 20mm cannon and a 250 pound bomb under each wing. This type was built in three variants standard fighter, fighter reconnaissance, and low altitude fighter, which used a Merlin 32 with a modified supercharger for optimal low level performance. The new Seafires of both types, however, still did not have folding wings, a major constraint. This made them a problem for the Royal Navy, especially as some of their carriers didn't have aircraft lifts big enough to allow the new aircraft to be stored in their armoured hangars. Instead, the Royal Navy had to do away with their standard doctrine and resign itself to now employing permanent deck parks, something they had originally had to do on some ships with the Sea Hurricane. Parking aircraft on deck was the norm with the US and Japanese carriers, but not for the Royal Navy, as their concepts on carrier design were based around the fact that their aircraft carriers were going to get hit in the constrained waters they were expected to fight in. Having nice flammable aircraft all over the deck was, as a result, not in their original thinking, but there wasn't any option until a proper carrier variant could be built with folding wings, so the Royal Navy employed outriggers to allow aircraft to be parked on deck without too much clutter. Though they may not be ideal, the Seafire 1 and 2s were ready for action in a comparatively short span of time, being deployed on British carriers in the Mediterranean in time for the invasion of French North Africa, Operation Torch, in November 1942. Here they tangled with the French Diwatin D520, an aircraft that was no slouch in air combat, and proved to have a useful attack capability when they bombed enemy airfields. The Seafires would then prove valuable during the invasion of Sicily, and then the Italian mainland, providing a quick reaction capability to British task forces, though they still generally preferred the Martlet for maintaining cap because of the aircraft's better endurance. It wasn't all rosy though. The Seafires' tricky landing characteristics proved especially attritional with its heavy usage in this period, a factor that would devil the aircraft's reputation. The Seafire had a tendency to bounce if the pilot didn't put the aircraft down perfectly, missing the wire, or could even swing sharply due to the torque from their Merlin engines, a cause of a number of accidents and losses. Additionally, the narrow undercarriage tended to tip the aircraft over to one side for the slightest of reasons. Plus, the position of the arrestor hook meant that the Seafire often nosed over in a heavy landing, damaging the propeller. This led to the famous expedient of soaring off several inches of the prop, which resulted in a surprisingly small loss of performance of only a few miles per hour, but which allowed carriers on operations to keep their Seafires airworthy. Indeed, at Salerno, the Seafires were credited with two kills and four damaged enemy aircraft, as well as driving off multiple attempted attacks. But it came at the cost of 42 Seafires lost, all of them in accidents. Despite the issues, the Seafire 1s and 2s had proved the type's worth, with 166 Mark 1s and 372 Mark 2s ultimately built. However, plans were already in action to build a proper, dedicated naval Seafire. This would be the Seafire Mark III, which at last would have the folding wings that would allow the aircraft to operate off just about every carrier the Royal Navy operated. Making the aircraft's distinctive elliptical wing foldable was tricky, as it was a precision piece of engineering. But it was achieved by the novel trick of having two joints in each wing, one just before the cannons, the other towards the wingtip. This allowed the Seafire Mark III to reduce its width from 36 feet 10 inches to just 13 feet 6 inches. However, a trade-off had to be made in that the armament had to revert to the 220mm cannon for 303 machine gun fit, and this was the standard armament for the Seafire 3s. Again, the type was built in several versions, all equipped with varieties of the Merlin 55, 
that produced 1,585 horsepower. But in recognition of the fact that most carrier aircraft fighting took place at below 15,000 feet, the vast majority of the 1,220 Mark III's built were of the LF or low-level fighter variant. The added weight from the changed design for naval operations did impact performance, but the Mark III LF could make 358 miles per hour at 6,000 feet. In fact, up to 10,000 feet, the Seafire Mark III was the equal to anything else, being able to outrun and outmaneuver even such doughty equivalents as the F6F Hellcat and F4U Corsair. Indeed, it apparently could outperform the Spitfire Mark IX up to that altitude, a very respectable claim. The Seafire 3s began to enter service in April 1944, just in time to take place in the attacks on the German battleship Tirpitz that was holed up in a base in Norway, and which had represented a threat to convoys for years. For this operation, the Seafires provided fleet defence, while the raid itself was conducted by ferry barracudas and wildcats, hellcats, and also another new addition to the FAA, the Vault Corsair. The decision to use the American-made fighters gives an indication of how the Seafire's range and more limited payload told against it for these sorts of strikes, though they would see further deployments in the follow-up attacks against the Tirpitz over the next few months, even making some kills of German aircraft that came looking for the task force. Because the limitations of the Seafire's heritage, limited range, fragility and delicate handling, was the price that was paid for a truly superb fighter aircraft in the air. And you don't have to take my word for it. Long-term watchers of the channel will have heard me talk of Grumman's legendary test pilot, Corky Meyer, on multiple occasions. He had the opportunity to test fly a Seafire in 1943, and had this to say about it. The Seafire had such delightful upright flying qualities that, knowing it had an inverted fuel and oil system, I decided to try inverted figure eights. They were as easy as pie, even when hanging by the complicated, but comfortable British pilot restraint harness. Spins were like a training aircraft, with instant recovery as soon as the controls were released. Acrobatics were a pleasure, the aircraft responded right after the thought came to the pilot's mind, seemingly without effort. I have never enjoyed a flight and a fighter as much before or since, or felt so comfortable in an aeroplane at any flight altitude. The lend -Lease Royal Navy Wildcats, Hellcats and Corsair fighters were only workhorses. The Seafire 3 was a dashing stallion. Mind you, Mayer was a hugely experienced pilot, and I don't think he had to take off or land on a carrier, because the Seafire continued to have a bad reputation as a dangerous aircraft to operate, a reputation that created a lot of prejudice against it. With the creation of the British Pacific Fleet in late 1944, the Seafires headed to the Pacific. Here they faced two significant problems, apart from their heavy attrition rate. One, their short range really didn't suit them to operations in such a massive theatre. Two, the commander of the fleet's air operations was Rear Admiral Vianne, who had done a similar job at the Salerno landings. He had a thoroughly negative opinion of the Seafire from his experience in that previous campaign, a view not helped when Seafire started crashing into his carrier decks. So low was his opinion of the aircraft that he even had Corsairs and Hellcats held back to provide fleet defence, impacting on the amount of projectable strength that the BPF could bring to bear. But despite these problems, the Pacific was actually the place which really gave the Seafire its time to shine. The big American fighters may have been tough, long-ranged and competent, but the Seafire was fast. Down low, it was, as already pointed out, really fast. As the BPF began to get into its operational stride in 1945, this was the same time as the Japanese started using kamikaze strikes en masse against the Allied fleets. And that was a threat that the Seafire could have been built for. While attackers did slip through, the Seafire proved extremely adept at running down the suicide aircraft and downing them. As the final months of the war dragged on, the Seafires even managed to alleviate their restricted range by salvaging some old P-40 drop tanks and in the best tradition of the entire aircraft, bodged them to fit. With these, the Seafires were able to range further afield, and even managed to take part in some of the final airstrikes of the war as it drew to a close. With the surrender of Japan, you would be forgiven for thinking that the days of the Seafire would be extremely numbered. After all, it was far from a perfect carrier fighter, and arguably a bit of a liability. But no. In fact, a brand new model was just coming into service as the war ended, the Mark 15. 
This combined most of the Seafire-3's fuselage and wings with some parts from the Spitfire Mark VIII, such as the tail and fuel tanks, and, most notably, the Griffin 6 engine. Ironically, the Griffin had been commissioned by the FAA before the war, and in rather typical fashion, they didn't actually get it into a combat fighter before it finished, the RAF basically calling dibs on them for the later marks of Spitfire. Equally ironically, the Griffin actually made the Seafire even more dangerous to operate from aircraft carriers. The Mark 15s were quickly replaced in production by the Mark 17, which used the same engine but had reinforced wings and a stronger and better designed undercarriage, which went some way to improving the type's landing traits. They also had a bubble canopy, which was fitted in the last production Mark 15s as well. Over the next couple of years, there were small runs of Mark 45 and 46 Seafires, which never served operationally before the final variant, the Mark 47, entered service with the FAA in 1948. And with this model, finally, the Seafire was the aircraft that was wanted from the beginning. Though, to be honest, that is probably because it had practically nothing in common with the original Spitfire that originated it. The Mark 47 had a bubble canopy, hydraulically folded wings that now only needed a single joint, four 20mm cannon, and the capacity to carry three 500 pound bombs. Fuel capacity was now 247 gallons, quite a step up from the 85 gallons of the Spitfire Mark I, and twice the fuel capacity of the first Seafires. But probably most useful was the fact that the Griffin 88 engines of the Mark 47 had a rotor contra-rotating propeller. This countered the torque issue that had been a problem on the Merlin-equipped Seafires and a nightmare on the earlier Griffin engine models, making the Mark 47, in the words of the Naval Air Fighting Development Unit, the best high-altitude fighter of all the piston-engined aircraft now in service. Though that wasn't to remain the case for long, and the Seafires, despite their surprisingly long run, would soon be replaced by the more capable Hawker Sea Fury and then the new jets that were coming into service. But it didn't go quietly. Mark 47s went to war attacking communist guerrillas in Malaya in 1949 before seeing action in the first few months of the Korean War, mainly conducting ground strikes on North Korean forces and airfields. Seafires would also see combat with the French in Indochina and, I suspect, with the Burmese Air Force, who acquired a batch of them surplus. They would also be used by the Australian and Canadian navies to equip their carrier fighter squadrons in the immediate post war era, as well as with the Irish Air Corps and all told, 2,646 Seafires were built. Now, that might not be a hugely impressive number by the standards of other naval fighters, like the numbers produced by the USA or the Japanese, and the Seafire might have been a bit of an oddball, for the many reasons I've covered here. But for an aircraft that was basically made up on the fly, that is a pretty good combat and longevity record, especially in a field as unforgiving as carrier operations. Hope you enjoyed the video, and if you are interested in learning more on the aircraft, I thoroughly recommend Supermarine Seafire by Matthew Willis. I relied on it heavily for research in this video, and even then I have only touched on a fraction of the massive details that is in this book. And some good news. The publisher, Morton's Books, is offering a 10% discount on purchases to viewers of this channel. All you have to do is go to their website, which I shall link to in the description, and use the discount code EDNASH10 when you purchase. They have a range of books on military history and other subjects, and that code is good for any of them, until the 31st of December 2023, and you can use it multiple times if you like. I'll point out now that I don't get anything from this deal, except a digital copy of the book for research and review, Maltons is offering this as they appreciate there are a lot of keen arrowheads in my viewership, and for me this is a way to show my gratitude to all you guys for your continuing support. So remember to check out Maltons books, share, like and subscribe, have a good one, and I'll catch you all on the next one.